Hi, I'm Bruce Gilliam, eighth Don and honorary board member of the International Ishinru Karate Association. Located about halfway between the California coast and Hawaii, Easter Island is an island almost completely and totally without trees. The history of Easter Island, though, tells the story of an island that was once heavily forested. Anthropologists, people who study cultures, often ask, what did the person who cut down the last tree on Easter Island think about while they were cutting down that tree? Their answer? They likely thought it was no big deal to cut down that tree. The reason is an idea called shifting baselines. The generation that grew up with almost no trees probably never really knew anything about trees, and therefore to cut down the last tree was no big deal. As students of Ishinru Karate, we need to be very aware of shifting baselines. We are very fortunate in Ishinru to only be three generations away from Master Shimabuku. This makes it really important to remember the legacy and history of the people who've gone before us. In short, we need to know our legacy. Accordingly, the Board of Directors of the International Ishinru Karate Association have decided to ask eighth dons and above from their board to sit down and informally discuss what their training and early upbringing in Ishinru was like. The collection of this informal conversation, as well as a group conversation about the future of karate is what this video project is all about. Thank you for watching this video and we hope that you find it useful. I started at the Harold Long School of Karate in Knoxville in 1965. The uh, early training at Mr. Long's uh, was a little different than it is now. Mr. Long uh, tried to run his dojo as near to the way Matsumbuku's dojo had been as he could as he could run it. He was open from 12 noon to 9 at night, Monday through Friday, and then he was open from 9 through 12 on Saturday. And students just came and went as they pleased, as they wanted to. He had uh, pretty standard workouts. Uh, when we went in, he always signed every student in when the student came in. Um, then um, the first order of business was to work on chart one and chart two, the basic items. And that happened uh, every class. And that was 10 times to each side for every item. And from there then, uh, if you were learning kata, then he would always give a new part to the kata. And those, that was all set. He had uh, a certain number of parts in each kata. And uh, he would, when he signed you in, he would write down which part of what kata you were working on and the charts that you were working on. And if you were working on our knife defense techniques, which were stressed in those days. Then at some point during every class, you had the opportunity to uh, what Mr. Long called match, which kumite or uh, sparring, we call it now most of the time. Mr. Long's word for it was matching. But when there was matching going on, it was always, uh, the group always gathered around and sat down and he required attention to that match by everybody. And there was only one match at a time. There were not many classes like we think of class today in our dojos. Um, the, it was pretty much individualized. Everybody helped everybody. When several people got in the dojo, instead of Mr. Long giving those new parts to Katas or working with somebody on knife defense, then the more advanced students would help the less advanced students work on those parts to Kata and work on knife defense or, or whatever it might be. Early, the thing emphasized the most was chart one, chart two. And I think that's very different than you see today. Kata was always emphasized in that 
You had to learn kata in order to get any promotions. You had to have three katas when I came up. Saison, Sayucha, and Nahanchi before you could have learn any matching techniques. And when I'm talking about the emphasis on kata, it was a different kind of emphasis. Mr. Long wanted us to learn to go through the techniques in the kata. As far as an emphasis on how those techniques were how those techniques were performed, how the kata was performed, kata practice because of how it, to try to make it look a certain way, we never did that. We never prepared kata for a tournament. And when we went to a tournament, Mr. Long just always said, do the kata like you do it in the dojo. There was no such thing as safety gear then. Um, now, occasionally you'd have uh, some folks come in with some of the pads you buy at the drugstore to, to go over bruises, over elbows, or even on hands. And Mr. Mr. Long always called that armor, and he wouldn't let us use any of it. In fact, he even called a mouthpiece. He called that armor. He didn't want he didn't want mouthpieces. He didn't wear a groin cup. He never wore a groin cup. Uh, he didn't do a lot of high kicking either, so uh, he wasn't in so much danger of, of getting hit in the groin. And plus, he was uh, strong, stayed close to the ground. But uh, he did allow us to wear groin cups. And then at some point, we started wearing mouthpieces, and he didn't object to it anymore. I do remember the very first tournament uh, that Mr. Long allowed safety gear in. And nobody had ever practiced with it, never used it before, but, and we passed the, a lot of the safety gear around because no, you know, folks didn't have any of it. Uh, and it was at the Coliseum. And you talk about a slug fest. You know, with, with no practice with that stuff before, all of a sudden people put the gear on. It felt like they had gloves on, so somehow everybody got the idea that now we we go at it as hard as we can and that's that's kind of what it became and it was pretty sloppy until we learned to use to use that safety gear started in 1963 the latter part and all uh basically i guess the way i ended up in the issue karate when i was in service i was on a base boxing team and uh Found out later in there they allowed professionals to fight and everything. And after coming up against one of them one night, I decided there was something else I probably could work. So I got interested in judo and started into the judo process. And when I got discharged, why well, I came back to this area and uh, had gone to work up at Oak Ridge and. Uh, there was a guy around in another area that was teaching uh, a particular system. He's the only one I'd heard about in the system. So I went over and signed up. He was fairly impressive. But one night while we was working out and we all looked up at the doorway and seen this guy standing there, man, just a pitcher with his crew cut and had this gear rolled up and this red and white belt wrapped around it. And we're all like, what is that? Or who is he in there? Right? And this rough voice come out and they're like, said, come here, son. And that was to our instructor he was talking to and everything. Well, I found out later that was Harold Long and everything. Anyway, Mr. Long got him over to the door and he said, I understand you've been telling all these policemen over here and everything that you can wire me out. And he said, so I just come over here to show you you don't know nothing about karate. And he Guy said, well, and Mr. Long said, that's not it, son. He said, just tell me where the dressing room is. He said, I'm going to go down here and get dressed, and we're just going to see what you know. And I could tell he really didn't want to get into this, and he started telling Mr. Long, well, you know, you got to do this for this point, this for that. Mr. Long said, I'm not interested in the point thing, son. You just do the best you can do. I'm just going to show you what little you know about karate. Well, sure enough, he went and got dressed, and he come back and everything, and they bowed in, and everything that this guy was studying under would throw, Mr. Long would block it so hard you could kind of see the scrunch in his eyes and everything, and he really wasn't wanting too much of this and everything, and Mr. Long got worried, just kind of backing him around the room, you know, and everything, and all. Right next to the end of it, Mr. Long just hauled off and popped him, didn't really pop him as hard as I found out later Mr. Long was doing. He said, now, son, 
just want to show you it's obvious you don't know much about karate and I'll, and I didn't come up here to hurt you this time but if you tell any more people that you can wire me out so the next time I come back you really have to answer for it now I so we get done we're sitting out on the porch where I tell some of them other people I said I don't know about you guys, but I said, I was really impressed with that guy. And I said, I don't know where he's at, but I think I'm going to find out. So anyway, I found out Mr. Long was over in Knoxville. At that time, when I first went, he was down at Pascal's down on Kingston Pike under the arena. He had a little room back in the corner back there and everything. His desk was out to the front. And I walked in, was talking to him, and I told him about where I'd been and him coming over and everything. He said, well, what did you come over here for? I said, well, I come over here to get one of them belts like you're wearing. I didn't have no idea that red and white belt meant anything, you know, and everything. He looked at me, I never will forget, he said, son, said, you'd be lucky if you can even get a black belt under me and everything. You know, of course, that really got me. I thought then, you know, I'm going to have to stay. Mr. Long, the one thing about Mr. Long's teaching was, you know, he was a firm believer in the basics. You know, a lot of schools run different now. People start out, they do a lot of exercising to get warmed up and everything. Back then, Mr. Long, you know, your, your basics was working on charts one and two. There wasn't a whole lot of warm up. You might do a little bit of stretching. Of course, now if you come in late, like his class of eating, and he started a really a serious class thing around seven uh, and all, and he also did his kumite in the evening there. If you come in the least bit late, you weren't gonna get opportunity to warm up because he was gonna punish you a little bit. When you walk through his door there in East Fifth and the ring was right there and everything, the next thing he's gonna say, just hit the ring. Mr. Long, like when I started with him, you know, he had to be around like 32 years old and he hadn't been back from the Marines long and everything, you know, cause, uh, you know, and he, at the time, he, he liked to match quite a bit with some of us and everything. I got to do a lot of matching with him and he didn't do nothing fancy, but boy, he was, it's hard to get a thing of past him. And when he blocked, he blocked the same way he taught. The one thing Mr. Long was a firm believer in was a hard blocking and hard kicking and everything. He wanted his people to do ever do some hard blocks, punching and kicking. That's the way he set the thing up and all. He used to say that your best offense is your defense. He said, when that guy throws that first move and you do that defensive thing, that ought to change his whole mindset right there. He really pushed the basics and the katas and, uh, and I think by being fortunate enough to get to study with him and work with him as long as I did and everything and be around him and all, why I had an opportunity that a lot of people didn't have that lived away and they had to travel more to come and everything and all. But uh, the fact that the way he would make you work those things, he said, you know, you're not gonna gain nothing out of them. If you think you've already done them the best you can do, then you're the stalemate. He said, you know, one hundredths of a thousandth of a second difference in that speed if you continue to work on it can be a difference in something hitting you and not hitting you. And Mr. Long did a lot of hand speed work. For a big man, he had some fast hands. And everything he throwed was pretty powerful, too. I started Ishinru in 1965. In June, I signed up at the dojo on Fifth Avenue. Uh, Mr. Long was not there at that time. He was sick, and Dickie Harmon was running the dojo for him. Uh, Alan Wheeler and Cass Cox and Glenn Webb were there. Uh, I think Mr. Wheeler was a brown belt at that time, and Cass, I believe, just got his brown belt. Uh, about three or four weeks later, Mr. Long came back, and I got to work out with him. The workouts were very simple. Mr. Long was very, very oriental disciplined. Once you walked into the dojo, you did not say anything. You, you sort of exercised a little bit. You hit the Makarawa a hundred times with the knuckles a hundred times shuto, and then you threw your kicks forward, forward on angle, side kick, and back kick you, you, until you loosened up good. And uh, after you did all that, you started your katas. And uh, if you spoke or said anything, Mr. Long would 
do like Master Shimabuku. He said, too much talky-talky. Do that. Mr. Shimabuku always, he did that when he came and visited us in 66. If we said anything, he'll say, too much talky-talky. But he did not like for us to talk. And it, everything was very disciplined. He ran it like a, a Marine sergeant, which he was. And uh, after we did the katas, uh, he wanted to do kumite and did street techniques. And uh, we, we just basically worked out till we couldn't breathe hardly. Mr. Long was a very, very tough man. I mean, he is, I've always said, if he and 100 people went into a room and they started a brawl, he'll be the one to walk out. He had very, very powerful punches, very, very powerful kicks. What impressed me about his straightforward kick was it was like a whip. That you crack off a whip when he, when he threw it. I'll tell you another one. I, after I got uh, learned Sunshin and became a tough black belt, quote unquote, I was his dummy in the classes and he hit me with a side thrust kick. He was demonstrating the power, and I was standing in Sanchin like that, and he took a side thrust kick. This was in front of a class for about 30 or 40 people, and he dismantled my spine. I mean, I felt it rattle. I went home. I couldn't hardly walk. I got in bed, and I couldn't get out in the morning. And today, which was like 45, 44 years later, I still feel the pain. Mr. Long had two ways of doing things, his way and the wrong way. If you didn't do it his way, then you were doing it the wrong way. And you had to abide by the dojo rules. If you, if you said anything abusive, he would kick you out. If he saw you abusing another person, you know, like a black belt beating on a green belt, boy, he'll take you out and uh, straighten you out real quickly. He never liked things like that. Uh, he was very sincere in his relationship with the people. You knew exactly where he stood. There was no two ways about what he fe felt or what he thought. There was no two ways about what he's going to do next. I mean, when he wanted you there, you'd better be there. I started with a gentleman named James Buster Maples. And I started with him, and I guess it was... 1979. I met him in a bar and he whipped me. So I started taking classes under him. James Maples, he died, and he, he told me before he died, he said, if anything happens to me, I want you to take karate under her alone. I believe I'd, I was about 24 years old at that time because he said, he asked me how old I was, but I never could. I never kept up with my age, dates, and stuff like that. And second year, I'd signed a contract with him. He asked me how old I was. I told him 24 again. Then third year, he said, "How old are you, Smith?" I signed that third contract. I said, "I'm 24." He said, "Now hell," he said, "You've told me that the last three years." I said, "Well, I, don't, I really I, I don't keep up with it." I said, "Just put down 24, and we'll change it." if we have to later, so he, he wrote it down. My nights was on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and the workouts were hard there. You went in, and you bowed at the door, you went to the dress room, turned face the floor and bowed, put your uniform on, and you come back in front of the mirrors, and you start doing charts one and two. And you worked on charts one and two till a higher belt come over to give you your assignment for the night, whether it might be working on katas or uh, it may have been if you was a beginner, it was a new part of your charts. They taught you the charts and parts just like the katas, my son did. But he run the school like a little boot camp. He was a drill sergeant in the Marines and that's about the way he run his school. The kids, you couldn't hear a whisper in his building whatsoever. Maybe once every three months, you might hear somebody talking and you'd hear Mr. Long come out on that floor. He said, if I would assign, wanted you to stand here and talk, I'd assign you to stand here and talk. 
and it didn't make any difference. You look around, see who he's speaking to, because when he spoke, he was loud, like Sergeant Emery on TV, and you didn't know if he was talking to you or, or who. You looked to see, everybody did. And sometimes you would look around, and it might be a little old kid, eight, nine years old, it might be a red and white belt. And it didn't make any difference, he'd give them the same speech, but uh, you could hear a pin drop about any time. You heard more noise off the uniforms of cracking, and uh, or if you was doing kumite off people's rib cages, he loved to hear that dull hollow sound off them ribs. My phone did, but uh, you 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 do your charts and you'd take your assignment and you worked hard. You didn't uh, stand around and talk. There weren't none of that at all. Well, I started in 1967. Uh, through Phil McElroy. Phil actually was the one that got me started. Uh, we went to the same uh, school uh, for a short period of time after I got out of high school, and uh, he introduced me to the uh, Schaefer group, and I did this five days a week uh, for the period of time that uh, before I went into the military, and uh, which was in 1969. But uh, the workouts were. Uh, they were not, I didn't think they were hard because we grew up in a hard fashion. But uh, that group of people were, were some of the absolute best that I, I've ever been around. And it kind of rubbed off. You, it was a matter of survival. Uh, there were not many people that, that got their black belts at that time through that, through that group. But uh, they certainly were a, an awesome group of people. The, the workouts were, were rigorous. Uh, but challenging, I'll, I'll put it that way. We were trained sort of like pit bulldogs at that time, you know, just to uh, survive if you could, go to classes, last as long as you could. But uh, it was a great time. And probably the most enjoyable thing I've ever done one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and I got into it because uh, I was too small for team sports, football and Basketball, baseball, I played all of those things, but it's, there was, it didn't have the same reward, um, primarily because you were sharing it with other people. And the other fact was you may not have been on the first team all the time. Uh, this was the one thing that you could do. When, if you lost, it was your own fault, I'd like to think. As far as the workout itself, it was a, uh, and I, I hate to use this term again, survival, but these, these boys wanted to hurt you and uh, just getting through that on, on a daily basis and trying not to, to get under anybody's skin to where they wanted to come after you personally was, was a tough thing. The contact itself back then, I think people expected it. They didn't really mind it. I, I can't say that over a period of all this time that I actually got hurt uh, more than probably five times or less. We were not uh, the best in the world on Kata. Uh, because it was not pushed uh, as it was under Mr. Long. Uh, and in doing so, uh, it made us a little different from, from other people in Ishinger. Not that much better per se, but just uh, uh, we looked at things a little bit differently. We had a great group of people. Uh, they were at the time probably uh, the, the cream of the crop in the South. And uh, when Mr. Long came along in 1969, I think it's when we first met him at the old Tennessee State Fairgrounds, uh, we, we had an extraordinary group of black belts and brown belts. And uh, we had uh, a, a lot of the names you wouldn't even recognize from that time. It's been so long ago. But Philip uh, survived, and uh, as did I so far but it, it's been a great it's been a great ride i started uh ishinu karate when i was 20 year old in nashville tennessee i uh, i started with i was luckily uh had the opportunity to start it under some of the legends denny schaefer uh phil mcelroy jim mcdonald and jimbo butler I had a lot of opportunities as far as uh, learning uh, 
fishing rule technique, but I wanted to know at that time from a, a contact standpoint how I could handle myself. So I focused on that. So I really didn't uh, take advantage of all the opportunities that's there probably with the forms. And, uh, but I was with the right people to learn how to really do that and start being a competitor. I was looking to see if I could handle myself. And we unknowingly worked out to what I thought was getting in good shape, but always working out to do is, is to stay tough. And, and uh, it was more or less only the strong survive. You know, you went and you worked out and if you could handle yourself and if you couldn't handle yourself, you just didn't come back. At first, I felt like, almost like I was trying to be run off because uh, they fought so hard. And I mean, I'd go home with my nose bleeding. Uh, and, you know, my wife, you know, after about the fifth or sixth class, you know, she begged me to quit. Said, you know, these them guys don't like you. And I said, well, they're not going to run me off. I'm going back. But by the time, you know, within six months, I was making friends with everybody there. And, and when I left, it was a teary-eyed situation just to leave the friends that I made during that time. And you know, after 30 plus years, they're still good friends. I started karate back in the mid 70s. I was interested in finding some sort of activity uh, that I could do uh, for the rest of my life for a long time. And, uh, and somebody suggested I, I look into karate. And in those days, um, one of the interesting things about uh, karate schools, karate dojos, is that first there weren't very many of them. So um, people had to actually kind of hunt a little bit uh, to figure out who the instructors were and where the dojos were and, and so on. Um, so the whole uh, karate community, I guess you'd say, was just not very big. I, in fact, started my training in a in a small YWCA here in Blount County uh, in the basement. And so the floors were sort of cold linoleum. And, um, and I can remember um, that often when it rained, uh, there'd be puddles of water on the floor in the basement of this Y. And, uh, and part of the job of the underranks in the dojo was to always make sure there were um, supplies of paper towels, because anytime it rained and there were puddles, it was our job to get out the paper towels and soak up all the water and, um, and make sure you could at least get some kind of workout in. The workouts were, were informally organized. Um, we would have a formal bow-in and a formal beginning, and, um, and then pretty much at some point, Lewis would say something like, okay, uh, get to work. And everybody knew what that meant, so you would go uh, get to work on kata, and, um, he would come around and show you what he wanted you to know. Coming up through the ranks, the thing that was um, stressed to us over and over and over again was the importance of kata. Um, Lewis and JC would tell us over and over again, um, you know, that competition is important and it has a, um, a big place, but um, things that happen for tournaments and competition are certainly different than um, than the karate training that goes on day in and day out in the dojo and that the, the thing to work really hard about and, and on um, was the day-to-day -day lessons uh, from the dojo. So we worked hard on, uh, on kata, uh, we worked hard on the charts, um, control in kumite was, uh, was really important. Um, Self-defense was, and, and the application of, of movements from kata was stressed. We would travel to other dojos in the area um, to work out, and I was, it was amazing how consistent and alike everything was. Um, so it, it was really no big deal to go to Athens or to go to Knoxville to Mr. Long's dojo and work on Saison. And everybody was doing Saison largely um, the same. So it gave you this idea of, um, you know, the stuff you're learning 
was being taught to you very well. There was a sort of core competencies out there that everybody had uh, and everybody thought the same things were important. So it was pretty neat. I started karate in August of 1976 in Athens, Tennessee. Um, this, is, this will be my 35th year. I um, actually started karate um, in the basement of my sensei's home because I was too embarrassed to go to the dojo. <laughs> It, it was awkward, you know, it was just different. So um, he worked with me on the charts um, and I, I'd started Saison, the first part of Saison. And then I went into the dojo after that. I started, Bruce, because I felt it was important that women knew how to defend themselves. We worked out every Monday and Thursday and Saturday morning. Uh, workouts were from 6 o'clock until 9 o'clock on those nights. Um, um, when I started, we were at the YMCA downstairs, concrete floor, dirty concrete floor, no air conditioning, no heating. In the summer, we were hot. As you can imagine, it was unbearable. In the winter, we froze, and our classes were very, very intense. The class would start out with first with our charts, went through charts every workout, and then we would go directly into kata, and we would spend hour, hour 15 minutes on, on the art, and then we would go with kumite and self-defense techniques. Most emphasis was placed, again, on the kata. You know, we... We had, you know, we, we had to know everything. We were required to, um, to know our weapons. We had to know all of the weapons. We had, of course, we had to know how to come to, how to referee. When we were brown belts, we had to know exactly what to do when you got into a ring if you were, if you're gonna be judging. Uh, but emphasis, again, was placed on the art, on learning the art, because that's our foundation. I realized that being female in that male-dominant activity um, required that, that I put forth more, and so I did. I made it very hard on myself, and I shared that same sentiment with the other women that came in. And so the, the ladies from, from the dojo became known as very strong, aggressive, female karate cops. I think now women are starting to realize, I can do this. I started as a, as a kid in a, in a children's program. Um, began my instruction with uh, Master J.C. Burris in Athens, Tennessee. And um, at the time when we started there, I started in the children's program. Uh, the training was, was a lot different than it is today. I think one of the, probably the biggest things is the most different was the informality of the training as opposed to the way classes are run today. They were very, very informal type classes, but they were very structured at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Burroughs was a, um, he was an educator by, by trade. He was an English teacher, baseball coach at the local high school. So he had a good grasp of teaching and teaching methods. And, and uh, our, our classes were generally as we started them, uh, in the very early days when I first started, we, we didn't even bow in. We just came into the dojo. If you got there a little early, you went to work on kata or charts. And uh, then during the course of the, the class, we would, uh, you know, Mr. Burris would have us to, to do individual instruction in kata or self-defense and a lot, of, a lot of kumite. Mr. Burris was a very well-balanced instructor. And we did, we, of course, we did a lot of fighting, but that wasn't our primary focus. Uh, he made sure that, you know, that we worked on our, our basics, our chart techniques, uh, kata equally, kumite, and uh, self-defense. So he, he was very well-rounded. We, uh, I don't really remember a time in our dojo when it was, you know, you know when we emphasized one thing more than the other. He, he made sure that we were we were very well balanced in, in everything that we did. And, uh, you know, looking back at that now, I, I appreciate that because it, it gave us an overall view of Ishinru and all of the 
elements concerned with it that I think are, um, <clears throat> you know, are, are essential for, for longevity in the art. The workouts were, were pretty hard, you know, and, and I know a lot of people from years gone by make that claim and, and uh, ours weren't fanatical by any, any means, uh, but, but they were tough. A um, lot of repetitions. Uh, especially on basic techniques, Mr. Burris always made sure that we we did a lot of uh, a lot of repetitions and kata, you know, repetitions of kata. Um, you know, it was just um, that was uh, it was tough and it was fun at the same time. I had a lot of respect for him. We all loved him. He was our Caesar. And in, in if you equate uh, the Roman Empire, Caesar was the head and ruler and power of the Roman Empire. Messer Long was our Caesar. We all loved him. We all worked with him. He, we would do anything he asked us to do. Mr. Long, like when I started with him, you know, he had to be around like 32 years old. And he hadn't been back from the Marines long and everything, you know, because... Uh, Oh, and he, at the time, he, he liked to match quite a bit with some of us and everything. I got to do a lot of matching with him, and he didn't do nothing fancy, but boy, he was, it's hard to get a thing of past him, and when he blocked, he blocked the same way he taught. The one thing Mr. Long was a firm believer in was a hard blocking and hard kicking. I can remember being a yellow belt and having the the big dream of someday being a martial arts instructor. And speaking to Master McElroy, telling him, you know, my dream, just kind of nodded his head in his same old calm way and said, you can do that. And that meant a lot. That was uh, some support at, at a yellow belt, being a young teenager. And I think that's a, a big thing to to realize that the youth need that encouragement to, to be able to make that statement and then allow it to grow over the years. I think that's um, something that's very noble within martial arts. I think that we have a, a way to influence people's life in a positive aspect uh, in more ways than what we can even know just by a good um, a good word, good deed, and, and some s small support. Mr. Burroughs was an educator by trade, so you know he, uh, he had that. He was a very uh, uh, a low-key type of instructor, um, you know, a, a kind of a quiet type of instructor to, to a certain extent, but there was always discipline maintained. I mean, there was never a time when uh, you know, anyone would get out of hand or, you know, I mean, if uh, if anyone, you know, used poor control or, or just displayed any type of a bad attitude in our workouts, you know, Mr. Burris was on them right immediately. And so you just sort of knew when you came into the dojo after you'd been there a little while, you know, you, you just, you knew the things that you could do and things you couldn't do. But he was not, he was not overbearing in that. I mean, he was not a loud, you know, barking out commands instructor by any means. It was very low key. He was very, very disciplined in that. And, and his students were required to be disciplined as well. We developed a good friendship besides him being an outstanding teacher to me. And I spent a lot of time at his house in Sunbright. We traveled a lot together. All the seminars that he'd go on, he'd take me with him. I enjoyed that. You just had faith in your instructor, so we didn't, you know, we, I guess the culture of the dojo was such that we, we knew we weren't supposed to go ask, um, could we have a part to something? That when it was our time, it would be our time. And, um, and we would, we would be told what we needed when we needed. I also remember that for a really long period of time, I would ask questions of um, upper ranks and Lewis and, and JC, and, um, and I would ask, you know, well, wh what's this for and what's this block for? And, and they'd say, for years, they said, well, it's just a block. Um, 
so for a really long time, I thought I was just asking really brilliant questions. Um, and then at some point, I stayed around long enough, and I finally figured out um, I, I was just asking about things I didn't need to know at that time. Uh, and so they were really good at allowing me to discover things that I needed to know when I needed to discover them. Um, and, and sometimes I think we've, we maybe have lost that today. I'll never forget going to a ladies' luncheon um, at one of our large corporate offices there in, in the community. <laughs> Fifty women were there that day, and I was up on this stage, and the uh, PR lady, the personnel director, had, had worked out in karate for a little while. She came to me and surprisingly walked up behind my back threw her arms around my neck like she was going to choke me out. And as she was doing that, she was saying, what are you going to do? What would you do? What would you do? Now, remember, this is in front of about 50 women. So instinctively, I just dropped to the floor, and I flipped her over my shoulder. She fell out into the audience. She had a skirt on. Her skirt went over her head. Of course, I was just like, oh, what have I done? But it, it just became second nature. The ladies in the audience loved it, stood up and started applauding. They thought it was just fabulous. I guess what was even better about that story, Bruce, that event was that she came to our dojo three months later and signed up. We did the demo on uh, Market Square during the Dogwood Arts Festival. And he was uh, wanting to demonstrate to a bunch of TVA people there, and I was trying to impress them. Here I was with my gi and looking good in a black belt. And he stood up there and he said, let's show them some techniques. He said, Mr. Masasa, throw a punch at me. You know, I threw a punch at him and he blocked it like as if he was driving a train. And he hit me with a punch and he hit me right here. And I felt my chest collapsing. I really did, and I was thinking, oh, God. And he said, let's do it again, I would do it again. I couldn't hardly lift my hand. He said, do it, do it again. You know, so I did with my left, I lift up, tried to hit, and he hit me here. And I was standing up there, I couldn't breathe. I, he was looking at me, he said, are you all right? And I said, I'll be all right, just don't ask me to hit you again. <laughs> One of my first instructors, Ron Gregory, and they call him Root, and he had, just recently returned from Vietnam, where he was uh, one of the grunts that uh, ran the tunnels. So he was, it was pretty crazy, uh, very wild. And our first tournament we went to, I had to ride in, in the car with him and a couple other black belts, of course. I was a kid and they were adults. And, uh, he, always, he was telling me that uh, he always got disqualified. And I, and I didn't understand what that meant at the time. But I watched him the next day during the uh, competition, and as soon as they said go, he would go and then never stop. And that was one of the reasons he got disqualified. But about a year later, I got to see, maybe not quite that long, um, he did chase a guy out of the ring, bent him over the judge's table, reached down and grabbed the microphone with the 10 pound lead weight on the end and was in the process of hitting the competitor with the microphone stand. And uh, about the time that uh, the instructors got him out of, out of the position. So it was, uh, it was very impressionable as a, as a young person. Uh, not that it was uh, a good impression, but it it did teach uh, a combative spirit, and that, that spirit uh, carried on through the Nashville group. You know, Mr. Long moved up into Scott County up there, and my school was down, uh, you know, in that area. 
and he'd come down on Saturday mornings when we had our young people's class and bring Logan, Gary, and them son with him and everything, you know, and uh, Logan was just real little then, and we'd go down to Cracker Barrel, and he'd end up telling some tales and everything, you know, and I guess it was the friendship was a, was a big part of the thing, you know. One of our black belts was a, a man still is a practitioner named Sid Wright. Sid was my senior in the dojo and just an excellent, did an excellent Sanchen Kata. And in demonstrations that we would go to, uh, Mr. Burris would always break boards and sticks over him as he would do Sanchen Kata. It was always great and I always loved watching him do that. In one particular demonstration we did at the local high school, Mr. Burris invited someone to come up and punch Sid in the midsection, you know, while he was performing the kata and, and the guy he got was like the football coach there. He's big, pretty good sized, you know, hefty fella. And he was, you know, he told him to go up there and just, you know, punch Sid in the midsection as he's, as he's doing that. And, uh, and that guy did. I mean, Sid went through the kata and was doing a great job and that guy just set into, you know, just, you know, just bam, 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 bam. And Sid did good, never lost his concentration. Very, you know, uh, very good job in the kata. Sid always had a smile on his face, always. And I know that myself and my best friend who was training with me at the same time were sitting on the sideline. We watched Sid walk back and he was still smiling. <laughs> Sid sat down beside me and I looked at him and, and I said, did that hurt? And Sid said, yeah. <laughs> I had some Navy SEALs, that's what he was working with. He said, uh, who's the toughest guy in this outfit? And this big old fella steps out. He was quite a bit bigger than Mr. Long. He said, I guess that'd be me. And Mr. Long hit him across the throat and grabbed him by the shoulder and turned him around, took him off into that poop and just swam and plumped to the bottom. I ran over there looking and watching and held him out until he bubbled. Had some doctors there with him. Two or three jumped in the water. They brought him out of there and went pumping water out of him. He, he was unconscious. And uh, Mr. Long turned around to the group. He said, okay, he said, who's the second toughest guy here? Nobody stepped forward. He said, now we can start you training. He said, this guy, he didn't make it today. My very first day at the Harold Long School of Karate was a little bit memorable. Uh, he was. Mr. Long's dojo was on the second floor of a building at the uh, corner of Gay Street and Fifth Avenue. And uh, so I was, the steps, the stairs were on the outside of the, of the uh, building there. You didn't go inside and then go up. So I was going up the stairs and this fella came out and he was a big fella. And his head was practically shaved then and had on a black gi and this black belt and I didn't know anything about that and it was faded uh, and he was a mean looking guy and it turned out to be Glenn Webb and as I passed him going up the stairs he, he went uh, kind of grunted at me so I went on up I went in then to meet Harold Long who stared a hole through me and invited me in but he smiled while he stared a hole through me and, and uh, so anyway I, I signed up signed my first contract and and uh, paid him my first twelve dollars, and uh, kind of wondering what I was getting into there. We were in a tournament in Nashville. This is many, 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 many years ago, back in the '60s. And the guy that fought me was from Mississippi, and he was a football player. And uh, we got into the ring, and he was a big guy. He had good techniques. I scored my point. He scored his point. He jumped up and hit me with a shooto, which was a beautiful technique. He started after that, we were tied, and he jumped up, hit me again, two to one. And he stood at the line. Every time I approached him, he jumped back out of the, out of the line. This stopped us every time he jumped back. And I was getting fed up, and uh, Bob Tress was in the middle. He was the chief referee, and Monji was in one corner, Bob Hill in another corner. Mr. Long was standing on the side watching. And so the next time he stepped, I followed him, and he ran up in the stands. This is the truth. He ran up in the stands. And I followed him six or seven rows up in the stands. <laughs> and he, he bent his head like that. And I jumped behind him, hit him with a hammer smash on top of the head and flattened him down on the stairs. And here comes 
Tress and Monje and all those guys pulling me back. We went in the ring and uh, he stood and lectured me. Un this is unsportsmanlike and this is, we don't do things like that. And I said, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And when we got out and I thought, I was looking for Mr. Long because he's the one that's going to chew my butt. And I went in front of him, he sat up there and said, I don't blame you. I would have done the same thing. <laughs> It, it's not quite the same. I don't think people look at it the same. Uh, back then, we were, I, I want to say we got into it for the fact that you wanted to be perhaps the baddest man around uh, in some aspect. The people nowadays are, are, it's not, they don't have the same life. We, we came from a harder, harder background. We enjoyed contact. Oh, I think the real big difference between now and then was the fact that the way when you practiced back then when you even had a partner and you was asked to throw some at him you were supposed to throw it like you was going to take his head off and you had to block it nowadays people don't want to do that they don't want their arms bruised up but you know when you left dojos up there i mean your your arms would be black and blue at times i mean we've practiced the same same block and everything you, you won't keep a dojo open too much anymore doing that and everything. I mean, people, I wonder, you know, why some of us stayed at times. But, but no, that was, that was the big difference. That and the fact of the point system now, which, which I think it's great for participation and everything and all, but it was so different than the way it was back then. We practiced a lot, you know, for hard blocks and punches and kicks now they're practicing so much for speed and just getting there to get the score you know that that's that's a that's a big change you know you always wonder how that's really going to work out in a street situation and compared to the old basic system the old basic system was you know somebody throwed something to you supposed to try to hurt them students were different um it, uh, it, it really was no big deal to look at somebody and say, well, all right, go ahead and get to, get to work, and people would just go do that. Um, when, it, when it came time for Kumite, um, as I was coming up through the ranks, uh, there weren't any gloves or things for our feet. There were no pads. Before pads, the emphasis was always on control, and you know, to really hit somebody um, without pads on was a huge error, and, and people got hurt. I think a lot of people, Bruce, are, they're not spending the time necessary on the art, on kata. That's where our basis is. That's where you're gonna, your strong foundation is gonna come from kata. And I'm afraid that a lot of people are more involved in the fighting, you know, the ground stuff that's going on now. They think they know the kata. I know how to get from first move of Saison to the last move I can go through. They've memorized the technique, but that's it. That's where I'm seeing things headed. And that's a shame because our style is going to suffer if, if we, as karateka, continue to, to uh, engage in that. It's so much more commercial now, no matter where you look. Um, in the old days, uh, nobody had insurance. You didn't need insurance if uh, somebody got hurt or if you weren't above board in your teaching methods. Uh, it was just overlooked. Today, there's so much more scrutiny through expecting professionalism um, that the what you get now is much more structured than uh, what was available then, generally throughout the martial arts community. I think that's a, it's a good thing, but within that, you also lose some of the toughness and the, the black and white syndrome. You know, it was either, in the old days, you were either a 
fighter or you weren't. Um, and now you can be uh, a decent fighter and a decent ground fighter and not do forms at all and still be accepted as being a martial artist. In the old days, I think being a martial artist meant that uh, you were a black belt and that uh, it had a different meaning then as it does now. Seems like everybody now is a black belt. At that time, we talked about self-defense as the purpose for beginning training much more than we do now. I mean, we talk about signing up, you know, coming to the dojo for self-defense, but I think we, it's, we emphasize that much less now than we did at one time. Some people says, you know, karate's dying, it's not like it used to be. That's not true. Now I think the kids, the people now are a little softer on account of the computer age, but that's just the way it is. You know, sometimes having calloused hands is not always good. That means you're having to work too hard and you're gonna wear your back out, right? But, you know, I, I look at, uh, it, it's, there's more there to offer than there's ever been. We talk about how hard the workouts used to be as opposed to now. I'm, I'm not sure. I think workouts are still pretty hard. I think they're just different. There's a greater emphasis on safety. Students are able to be exposed to a lot more now. So the opportunity for learning is probably greater now than it ever was at any time. Uh, not just for students, but for instructors as well. But I think that one of the things that's missing that I see now, people did the art because they just loved to do it. They, did, they learned Ishinru because they loved doing Ishinru. And it, it really didn't matter what they had to do. It didn't matter how many repetitions they had to do. Um, uh, they weren't as particular about, you know, when their classes began and end as they are now. I mean, so there was just a willingness, I think, to do more. Uh, back in those days. I mean, we, we just considered, you know, we were lucky. There weren't very many martial arts schools around at all. You know, today there's one everywhere. The training that we got, we felt lucky to have. And um, I think that's different today. The biggest challenge that I see is also uh, uh, my biggest personal goal, and that is how we're going to move the art of Ishinru into the future, considering all the things that are happening in the martial arts today. We have a niche that we fulfill at this point, and considering everything that's going on around us as far as the innovation of the MMA and, and whatnot, uh, we still have our, our uh, group, if you will, still doing the same things that we've been doing for years uh, without disturbing these other people. And uh, I think we've still produced as good a black belts as ever. If we take the, the lead and challenge everybody to study the art more, then the art will continue. If we sit back and say, no, we're not going to do, we're, we're going to take it a different direction, then your fear is going, it, it's going to happen, it's going to die. So it, it becomes our challenge as pioneers to really spread by talking, by demonstration, by visiting dojos, that art, that desire to, to learn more about kata. Well, and you know, we may not say that every meeting, but in our meetings, just like with our Kobudo uh, certification, that's exactly what we're trying to do there with our, uh, you know, with the council, our master's council, and the things we want them to do. I think that's what we're trying to do there. We may not say that to each other, but that's exactly what we're trying to do. You know, I agree with what Jim said about the niche. You know, but niches will come and go. The only ones that stay are the ones that are. Right. viable and mm -hmm. you know Ishinru is, is definitely sticking around but it's because of what everybody's done for us and passed down good technique good martial arts I know myself as Mr. Burris have taken that on this year to uh, to also uh, as a, a realization that even in our group the, the need for documentation 
education to the students because I know I'll not always be here, but the stuff that I had to use um, as I was coming up was very good information in its form. But now there's so much more information that's developed over the years. I think that documentation uh, in the dojo to your students as well as in the organization is a, a big step to making the style a viable style in the future. Well, you know, the understanding in the last 10 years or so has become much stronger on the kata performance. For so long, people had kind of let the katas, that was not their top priority, and that being one of the main things in the Ishinru system that you need to keep going, you know, is the fact of understanding the katas and the bunk eyes out of them and everything. And now that we've got a lot more interest back into them, that's the thing that Mr. Long used to say, that no matter if you move somewhere and you didn't have another instructor around close by, if you understood those katas and you could continue to work on them by yourself, week after week, you would always maintain a good karate form and a good means of self-defense. And I think there's been a lot more emphasis going on the katas in the last 10 years than there was for a while. Even though they've always been strong in the system, it's just picked up more, it seems like. Well, the huge, the biggest challenge, I think, is on us. Mm -hmm. What Ishinru, I don't think, most people don't understand what Ishinru has to offer till they get in it, really. You know, we're, doing, we're working out with, a couple times we've worked out with some, some guys that are going to compete with, in, a, in the MMA world. And... Uh, We've actually worked stand up and helped them, and I don't think until they worked out with us, they understood really what we were all about. You know, they learned a lot and they was excited uh, about what what they did. And I think we can draw more by just letting people know who and what we are. We're almost too humble and too quiet about who and what we are. Mm -hmm. But I really believe if we're gonna go into the fu future, we're gonna have to let the world know kind of who and what we are a little bit more than we. And I think one thing, too, that we always need to remember is we need to keep educating ourselves exactly. you know, constantly. Uh, we need to keep developing our art and our understanding of it, never get to the place where we feel like, well, we know, you know, we know, we know it all yet. We, we don't. We're a long ways from it. And just because when you're educating yourself, you're motivating yourself and you're motivating students. That's contagious. And, uh, you know, there's more out there to learn. And, you know, we, we need to learn it. Mr. Long always said the kadas was your foundation of Ishru Karate. So like Tommy said here, if you could only practice one thing, it'd be your kadas. That's where all your techniques is hid, and your learning comes from them. It just seems to be so hard for some reason to get other people in other styles to really see the importance of them. You know, I mean, they've got them, but there seems to be more emphasis on kumite than there is you know, and everything, but yet the whole general basics of most all systems really comes down to the basic fundamentals, you know, the daily practice of the fundamentals, yeah. You know. We know there, <coughs> there are a lot of things you learn from kata after you learn to get through those, the sequence of techniques. And that comes over many, many years. And Mr. Long taught it like that. He didn't stress okay, here's the way we're going to deliver this punch or deliver this block that much. He taught the sequence, and he knew that over time that's going to become meaningful to us. But in a lot of our schools, you know, once folks get the sequence, then they're off to other things. And I guess that's, that's what my fear is about not, you know, not carrying our art on into the future. We've got to keep that emphasis, like you were talking about, on the cotton. We've got to renew ourselves as we, uh, you know, as we work. You know, if we, if we take, if we could some way to the members, to the issuing world, if we get the word out there to break the kata down and practice those moves like you're doing self-defense, like we used to do in the dojo, you know, that can create an excitement for kata, that something isn't there um, because they enjoy kumite more. But, but if, you know, if they maybe break it down some way and, and practice that kata, every move, the way they want to 
react in the street, then that kafta itself is going to be better. They're going to discover things about that kafta that they didn't know about. You know, one of the, I guess one of the, the greatest lessons I ever learned was from Mr. Burroughs there that applies to everything, and we have to apply this to our study of kata as well, too, and that's the basics, making sure that you've got those basics down good, and I know that's been one of the things I think that takes people away from kata practice, that uh, just a lot of repetition of basic things, but we have to be able to stress to them too, you know, you can go off in bunkai and you can, you can create a lot of different things, but until you have those basics good and until you're able to return to those basics, you know, you don't make real progress, not substantial progress, but uh, as instructors we have to find a way to balance that, to, to have the students have an appreciation for the basic things that they do, and then from there they can build, you know, they can go on on their own. Yeah. Really, what's exciting about the, the issue system, the way it's taught, I think there's it's more family oriented. And if you look at our tournaments, you know the challenge for the next couple of years is to focus on the kids and their future anyway. But in our school, we're having more mom, dad, mom, uh, daughter, dad, son groups that are coming in and working out together. And if you look at it, and we teach it the way it should be taught. It really caters to that if you, uh, mm -hmm. if you look at because it's even though it's hard work, everything in the issue system can be learned and taught the basics of it. It ain't like a bunch of flying kicks and you have to be an athlete, a true athlete and gifted to learn it and be good at it. You just have to be dedicated. And I think I think in the future we're going to see a lot of families because you know what families going to work together and some of the MMA stuff, and, uh, but the, the Eastern Root system has really got a, a true method and process of teaching, and, and it caters to the family atmosphere. I really believe that. And it caters to, even if you want contact, we do it in our school. You know, we'll have one class, we're doing full contact, and the other one, we're actually, we teach control. We've got small kids. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. I really do. I think we're we're on course. But I, like I said a while ago, I think the challenge is up to us, though, to let people know who we are. Because it's not they don't know it. You know, the, the families come in and they find out. But there's more people out there. I believe if they knew what we had to offer, they'd be knocking on the door. Kelly, you, you bring up a good point when you say family there. What we use our basics for, we use the art of Ishinru to really help people develop exactly. in mind, body, spirit, those right. things we used to say many years ago. That's still what it's all about. And Ishinru is our way to help people develop exactly. physically and mentally and spiritually. And, uh, and it works. It may not be the only way, but it's our way. And we need to keep that intact. I guess I'm most optimistic about the uh, excellent technique I'm seeing uh, every year in, in our events, in our tournaments. Uh, I know I've gotten worried at times, you see, technique seems to be dwindling a little bit, and then it comes back. Uh, but in, in recent years, and even like we're talking about all the things that are that are going on in the martial arts, we're still seeing a lot of excellent technique there, and and I'm I'm always just uh, proud to watch the black belt kata division, for instance, and then it, in kumite you're seeing excellent technique, and in the weapons people are learning more and more, and I think that's the most encouraging thing to me right now. And if you go around a lot of tournaments. You can really see a lot of future in these younger people. I mean, man, there's some excellent young Kataka out there that is really doing some great performance. And I mean, they're, they're athletic, but they also are understanding the system. And they know how to take what they've been working on and apply it when they have a chance in front of the competition. And the competition has really grown over the years. It's kind of like in all the other professional sports and everything, you know, people have got bigger and more athletic and these young people are 
with all the chants and everything, they're all doing the same thing. You can see it in there. <clears throat> what I'm really optimistic about when I travel and see the schools and look at our school is how we're diversifying. You know, when I first started, I was the only black belt. And uh, I really did, I didn't even have a sparring partner. You know, it was, uh, and it, it was almost scary. But now we've got, uh, We've got black belts that stuck with it for years, and there's, we've got a subject matter expert for for ever everything. And I just see us being more diver diversified, even with. And we keep saying something because you see MMA on on television and stuff like that. We're finding now, if we really teach you right, there's stuff in the uh, Ishinru system you can do on the ground or standing up or whatever. You don't have to go hunt another style to get in. You just, just have to practice what you already know to do, really. And, and I see that happening, and I'm, I'm excited about that. You know, my, I'm, I'm getting old, my back hurts, so I don't work out <laughs> like I used to, but I'm seeing the younger guys coming up, and you know, they're, they're better than I am, and they're teaching stuff, that they're teaching me stuff. And, and that, I think it's, I believe in the future, we're gonna see it should really grow. And like I said, walk we'll go because of the, the family atmosphere, I think it's going to be more, and, and being a Christian, I think it's going to be more Christian based, and I'm excited about that. You know, it's uh, uh, it's going to be good for kids to be in that kind of environment because there's so many things out there now that's enticing them, you know, with drugs and alcohol. Uh, it, it just, it's just going to be a, a place to where they can go and see a role model. Just a question: Would yes, would uh, uh, would you encourage your son to play team sports currently? Yeah, you would. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you see anything different about how things are done today and how they were done years ago? Do you follow me? Yeah. Uh, I, I see yeah. the t the people that have been here. Uh, uh, David, for instance, uh, we've been in so many classes in. Uh, now I get to go see my grandson. Yeah. You know, that's something you can't, I couldn't do uh, in, in baseball or something like that, you know what I mean, being a team sport. But because it's an individual thing, you're out there supporting that little guy or girl, yeah. whatever. That's good and uh, if you can bring grandma and grandpa back to uh, uh, take a look at their, their kids, there's nothing but happiness there. So. Yeah, and I agree. You know, last <coughs> night we had, uh, small children's tournament in the school and all the grandparents got to come and seeing the family involvement and the participation from even extended friends coming in and watching the four and five year olds and the excitement that they showed and the, the skill that the younger folks are showing now it, you know it's, it's really motivating because as Jay said that tool that that changes lives. I, I really think God uses that yeah. as, a, as a huge tool and at the early stages, even in, all the way through the over stages, to uh, transform and develop our thinking and, and in our spirit. And I think that's that's what I'm most optimistic about. Yeah. You know, Mr. Long used to say that your future depends on your young people how well you train the young people and what they do with it in the future. That's what really maintains your future. And Mr. Long's biggest concern about the whole Eastern Route thing was us trying to keep it in the purest form and everything, like Master Shimabuku set it up in the way Mr. Long taught. And that's what most all of us agreed to do. You know, we would, we would try to build it in the way that those founders wanted it. And I think that's what we're still working on. But the young people, they're it. We got to pass it on to somebody sooner or later. What I'm so excited about, guys, is the fact that we're having so many women get involved now. When I started, as you know, there weren't that many females, and now we have a lot of women involved. That goes back to the family atmosphere, because Mama can go to the dojo to work out as well. So you know, I'm just I'm really happy to see the involvement of all ages, as well as stereotypes but now I do think that what we're going to have to do is go with the change of the fa family life atmosphere and we're already catering our tournaments to that type of thing because if you look at it you got a 
you know, and I've got seven grandkids, but and every one of them's different. And I can see, you know, a couple of them. One of them's going to be real good in forms, but he's just not that contact type guy. And the other one's going to be good in the ring, but he don't want to focus on doing forms in front of somebody. But then that's the reason I say, and it's like Max said, there's going to be something they can get excited about, and it's going to be, and everybody wants to compete. You know, you don't, and it's not, it's, it's, it's about winning, and you want to train yourself to win, but you don't have to win every time. Just you, you want to be able to compete. And, uh, and you I know, say, that, that yeah. takes me back to when, when uh, Sensei would, after we'd have a, be in a tournament, if you, if you didn't win, he'd always say, but did you learn something? Yeah. Did you learn something? And that's what's so good about what we're doing. And I, I, I think we, and they're saying that, that, that we're getting weaker and the karate's not what it used to be, and it's not. It's, it's better than it used to be. Yeah, it's a lot better. It really is. It's a lot better. Even, the, even our self-defense, our, like when I started out, I focused on, on, on kumite and competing because I liked the contact of it. But, you know, it, and it's a shame that I took a lifetime to figure out what was really yeah. important. If I'd put all that together, I'd been so much better a practitioner if, if I knew now, then what I know now. And it's up to me to teach that. And I think we are doing it. And because of that, we're gonna get better. You know, the only way we won't get better is if we quit. You know, we've got a lot to share, but we've got a lot to do to make it happen. And then, and like I said, well, I think it's up to us. The challenge is, is, is ours, really. It really is, because we built something that's, I think, special. And uh, I'm excited about it. And again, you know, I keep saying that, but just because on the spiritual side and the Christian side of it, I'm real excited about it. I think also we've tried to do something with this board, with our yeah. board meeting we had today, so that, so that it's not a, as in the beginning, there were only a few people that knew what was going on. So in each area, it was kind of a one-man show, and the rest of us came up. And now there are enough of us that, as a board, we can operate and run things as a group, not as individuals. And we're going to be stronger in a group, is my point, than an individual ever could be. I think Harold Long would be tickled with what he'd be saying today. Yeah. Uh, you're right. He'd be giving us things to do, yeah. but he'd be tickled. <laughs>